Well guys, Mike from Hardware Canucks here and this is going to be a little bit of a different video for me because it's actually a part of a confessional. And that confession really has to do with the Ghost Canyon Nuck that we reviewed last year. And I'll be honest with you, we came down like a ton of bricks on this. We thought it was overpriced, underpowered, and it was using a previous generation laptop CPU. But at the same time, over the course of the last year, we have been using this a ton as a production machine and as a gaming machine here at the office, and it has not let us down. But now Intel is launching this. You can call this the mark of the beast when it comes to the NUC space. This is Beast Canyon. And like you can see, it has been supersized past what a typical NUC is meant to be. At the same time, that has also caused a couple of issues with it. But we have come to start loving this just as much as the old generation NUC. But don't take that as a complete fanboy confessional right now because there's a lot that we still need to talk about this thing. So we'll do that right after a message from our sponsor and we're gonna go watch some Olympics. Do you want your processor to feel immense pressure and incredible cooling? Gotta get the Glacier 1. The Fantex All-in-One coolers come in 240, 280, and 360 variants with the all-new Acetec pump design that is powerful and quiet, plus this Infinity mirror cap that further muffles the pump noise and adds gorgeous ARGB illumination. You get an easy mounting system, high static pressure fans that you can daisy chain for simple routing, and a set of clips for tube management. Ooh, the Glacier 1 coolers by Fantex. Check them out below. All right, guys, with that out of the way, I wanted to get into some of the good, the bad, the ugly, and some amazing things about Beast Canyon. But to do that, I need to set the stage a little bit and talk about what makes up a NUC nowadays. So that would be the compute element, the baseboard, and a couple of other things that are actually going to make Beast Canyon unique in the market right now. First of all, of course, there's a compute unit that houses an embedded processor and its cooling assembly that's installed on what can best be described as a small motherboard. The space is pretty open too, with the main cooling being done by a vapor chamber that then pushes the heat to a top mounted fin array so that heat can get exhausted out the top. It's almost a self-sufficient PC onto itself with Wi-Fi connectivity, memory slots, and three M.2 connectors. But about those M.2 connectors, just take note that only one, and that's the one to the right of the CPU, is Gen 4 certified, while all the others are Gen 3. Meanwhile, the I.O. on the back includes HDMI 2.0B, two Thunderbolt 4 connectors, and six USB 3.1 Gen 2 ports, along with an Ethernet jack. Now, in order to understand sort of what's going on behind the scenes and under the hood of the Beast Canyon, you sort of need to understand what's going on in the laptop market. In the last generation, so for Ghost Canyon, Intel used a ninth gen processor. And at the time last year, that was actually a generation behind what was available on the desktop side. But this time in Beast Canyon, they're using Tiger Lake, which is arguably a generation ahead of the Rocket Lake processors that are on the desktop side. So we've already seen Tiger Lake in a bunch of laptops already. Now, what processors are they actually using? And that's a little bit interesting here. So Intel on the high-end Beast Canyon is using an i9-11900 KB, which is essentially an 11900HK from the laptop side, but it's being tuned a little bit differently to deliver higher speeds in lightly threaded scenarios. It also gets a nominal power level or PL1 of only 65 watts, so a desktop CPU this absolutely isn't, not by a long shot. Either way, this thing is light years ahead of the i9-9980HK in Ghost Canyon in pretty much every single respect. Remember, this is two generations removed from that one. There's also gonna be a compute element rocking an i7-11700B, which is pretty similar to the i9 in terms of cores and threads, yet it hits overall lower clock speeds. Anyways, the compute unit holding either of those CPUs gets installed into something that Intel calls a baseboard that's really a simple PCB with a full-size PCIe Gen 4 by 16 slot for optional GPUs. I'm saying optional since the compute element has its own display outputs for the processor's integrated graphics. So you can just use it by itself without having to install a secondary GPU. There's also a PCIe by four slot and another open Gen 3 M.2 storage slot on this thing. And there's good news on the pricing front too. At least for the i9 model, there is a price reduction. So 
The i9 Ghost Canyon ended up costing a cool 1550 bucks, and we saw retailers jacking that up to 1750 last year at the very least. Well, this new one, it's supposed to be 200 bucks less expensive, so it should be going for around $1,350 US. Meanwhile, the i7 version, that does not move one iota, it's still 1150 bucks. That is probably gonna be a real sweet spot for people who want to get into the NUC ecosystem. And I guess that brings me to what is so special or not so special about the Beast Canyon or NUC 11 Extreme. Well, it comes in an eight liter case and it also includes a standard SFX power supply, which is a huge departure from the Ghost Canyon. This one though is rated at 650 watts and it's 80 plus gold. Either way, once you populate all those other components that you have to put in there, this is still a pretty expensive solution, but given prices these days, it's not completely out to lunch. But from the outside, Beast Canyon is pretty compact. So it's shorter and longer, but the exercise is there to make sure it's compatible with longer 12 inch GPUs, whereas the NUC 9 could only fit eight inches, which seriously limited its top end potential for gaming. It's also more compact than most, but not all ITX cases on the market. And let's not forget here, this case is sort of pushing the NUC ecosystem up another size. But I do have to get a couple things off my back, particularly about the size, because the NUC, the entire point of that next unit of computing, be it Hades Canyon or even Ghost Canyon, has always been to cram as much power as possible into the smallest form factor possible. Ghost Canyon, it did it. It was a five liter chassis. You could put in a RTX 2060 into there, be it a custom one from Asus, was probably the most powerful GPU you could find. And now Beast Canyon is sort of taking that that essence of the NUC, the smallness, the coolness, the fact that it really lived in a segment of its own, and they're blowing it up to eight liters to that size of some very, very popular and well-known ITX cases on the market. So in that case, I just feel that in order to make it compatible with those 12 inch GPUs, that it's losing the specialness of the NUC design. It's almost like they made it like a current unit of computing or a cuck. <laughs> Okay, now that I've composed myself, yes, that's one of the main issues, but I also have to be completely transparent about another one of the issues that's sort of plaguing our sample here. What we wanted to do is we wanted to basically follow Intel's guidelines from the last generation of NUC. That was them saying that the compute element from upcoming generations would be compatible with Ghost Canyon. So you could physically take the NUC element, so the NUC 11 element from Beast Canyon, or buy it separately and pop it into Ghost Canyon and you could be running again. Yes, it's gonna be quite expensive, but technically it should work. Unfortunately, according to Intel, because we have a engineering sample of Ghost Canyon and we have an engineering sample of Beast Canyon, those compute elements are not interchangeable with these. Supposedly, that's gonna be fixed for the final revision when it's pushed out to retail. So another thing that I wanted to talk about is just the exterior appearance of, of this NUC. And yes, it's got fan grills on both sides. It looks quite, quite aggressive. But at the same time, it will blend into pretty much every space. I'm a little bit disappointed that Intel had to increase the footprint of this versus Ghost Canyon instead of building it up. But you're also gonna see that there's some underglow LEDs, there's that skull on the front, and all of that can be controlled with Intel's NUC Studio software. And unfortunately, it is a steaming pile of It's laggy, it crashes, it's only available on the Windows Store. It's frankly quite a mess. So Please, if you're gonna be getting Beast Canyon, take that into account. Other than that, both sides are completely ventilated so the GPU and power supply get access to fresh air, while there's also a trio of exhaust fans on the top. Intel also gives you a front panel hub with a UHS-2 card reader, two USB-A 3.2 Gen 2 connectors, and an audio jack. This is actually a lot better than most ITX cases and ATX cases on the market. Meanwhile, the bottom holds actually a few Easter eggs. This is where you have access to the baseboard's M.2 slot with this handy little door and a button that turns on and off the LEDs. And opening it all up is pretty easy too. There's a bunch of nice little touches too, like all of the screws are captured so they don't go walk about when you're taking the system apart. They all stay in place. But to get inside, all you've got to do is loosen the four back screws, pop off the top and side panels, and then pull forward two tabs that keep the fan bracket in place. That bracket then swivels upwards 
so you can access all the internals and the fans are actually protected from munching your cables by these relatively simple metal grills. And yeah, watch out since the case can tip over pretty easily since it's quite top heavy with that top panel open. There's a few things I want to mention about the interior too and some of them are extremely important. First of all, Intel's move to a standard 24 pin motherboard connector from the power supply instead of the custom 10 pin one from the last generation of NUC, so that would be Ghost Canyon. It's not quite 24 pin though, since some of the cables are missing for unused voltage rails, but you can run a standard 24 pin here without any problem whatsoever. And of course, GPU fitment, pretty straightforward too, as long as you understand that there are some hard limits here. 12 inch cards will fit, but they'll need to be limited to exactly double slot height and not one millimeter more. The PSU has a single right angle 8 pin PCIe cable and two 6 plus 2 pin cables, but this is where another one of those small issues lies. Those extra cables can cause some conflicts if you want to run a wider card with two power connectors. That's because the standard ones will make contact with the fan grills and you'll need to use what feels like way, way too much force to close everything up again. So do try to avoid larger GPUs. But I also want to mention something about the NVIDIA Founders Edition cards because they might cause a little bit of an issue here too over the longer run. That's because one of the fans is going to be blasting hot air into the tight space between the card and the power supply. On one hand, I didn't notice any crazy high temperatures, but you can't forget, this is actually pointing hot air directly towards the power supply. So looking past the GPU, and Intel has worked hard to isolate the compute unit from interior heat too. It draws cold air through a duct from the backplate and then pushes it up towards the exhaust fans. All in all, that makes the NUC 11 Extreme simply an interesting piece of engineering. There's been a lot of thought specifically on Intel's engineering side about how do you take all of these relatively hot running components and get that heat outside of the case. And that's really something that I wanted to talk about because believe it or not, first thing I'm gonna talk about is acoustics. This thing has been crunching through a Cinebench loop since I've been on camera. And I don't know, can, can you hear it? I've got a shotgun mic literally pointed down here. It is almost dead silent, not completely dead silent. But anyways, so what I wanted to do also is I wanted to put up this unit against a Ghost Canyon NUC9 as well as an 11900K desktop system and also one other thing. This is, oh geez, this is the GE76 Raider. This, along with its massive face size power brick, almost weighs as much as the NUC11. Now, the other thing that you need to be aware of is this thing has an 11980HK, which is the pinnacle of Tiger Lake right now in the laptop space. And since this uses a laptop derived processor, this comparison is gonna be really, really interesting. So let's get into that. The power output on the NUC 11's i9-11900KB is pretty straightforward. First, there's a spike to 110 watts as it hits Intel's PL2 or short-term power limit, followed by a drop to the rated 65 watts. The NUC 9 follows the exact same trajectory, though it starts off below 100 watts and maintains that higher power for a bit longer. Then it also levels out to about 65 watts. Meanwhile, the GE76 Raider uses a custom MSI power plan that keeps it above 80 watts for more than a minute and then levels out at 75 watts, which is still pretty high for Tiger Lake. But heck, if the laptop's cooling system can handle it, if anything, manufacturers have proven they want to push those chips to the max in order to win in benchmarks. But you might have wondered why there's so much space on the top of this graph. Well, say hello to Rocket Lake, guys. It's PL2 nails 233 watts before falling down to Intel's rated 125 watts. And of course, if MCE is enabled, this is going to be a lot higher over the longer term. Now, moving on to temperatures, you'll notice that every single one of those initial power spikes align with high temperatures and the NUC 11 isn't immune to that either. It briefly goes above 90 degrees and then falls to a pretty good 75 for the rest of the test. But look, I know some of you are gonna be ranting about that maximum temperature, but you have to remember this is expected behavior on Intel chips and there's no throttling whatsoever. Its results are actually better than the older NUC9 and a heck of a lot better than the GE76 Raider. That's definitely sacrificing cooling to get to top clock speeds. 
And of course, the U12S keeps the 11900 cool. I mean, what did you expect? This is only here for really demonstration purposes anyways. For the NUC 11, that all translates into clock speeds that hit a constant 3.4 gigahertz on an all core load, which is actually 100 megahertz higher than Intel's base clock. And remember, one of Tiger Lake's main claims to fame is its ability to run at higher clock speeds, at lower temperatures, and at similar power to previous generations. And compared to that 9980HK from two generations ago, in the NUC 9, that's exactly what happens to the tune of about 200 megahertz. As for the 11980HK, well, of course it ends up hitting higher consistent speeds because it's just guzzling down more power and it's being allowed to run very close to its thermal limits, whereas Intel settings for the 11900 KB compute unit are a lot more conserved than what MSI is pumping this thing full of. As for the desktop part, I have to mention this again, it's here just for rough comparison, and this is what you get for 125 watts, guys. And this is where the rubber meets the road, guys, and right away that Cinebench R20 score shows the benefits of Tiger Lake and its thermal velocity boost to 5.3 gigahertz. It's actually able to beat the desktop 11900K by a narrow margin, and it just dominates last year's NUC. This should make for some really interesting gaming results though. But when you get into the multi-core testing, the lower power NUC 11 will always start to lose out regardless of which architecture it uses. That desktop part just sucks down power and it's just so much more powerful. With that being said, the speed up over Ghost Canyon is pretty massive. Blender sees the results from Cinebench sort of mirrored, but now the NUC 11's getting right up into the GE76's face with some really comparable results despite using less power. What's really crazy is the NUC 11 consumes about half the 11900K's power, but in the last two tests, its results are only about a minute or less behind. This just goes to prove there's a law of diminishing returns when it comes to pushing more power into a CPU. And look, Rocket Lake's being pumped for all it's worth to compete against AMD. Maya, on the other hand, shows what we've already seen, though drawn out over a much, much longer test. There's just no way a 65 watt laptop CPU is ever going to compete against a high-end desktop part, even if it has the same number of cores and more cash. But I do have to compliment Intel for making some major improvements over the NUC 9, and it really makes me wonder what would have happened if Tiger Lake had come to the desktop. Now, moving on to GPU accelerated benchmarks, and things get a little bit interesting, but let me explain here, guys. Nvidia's advanced Optimus on the laptop side allows for both the GPU and IGP to process this render in parallel, but you actually can't do that on the desktop or on the NUCs, at least not as efficiently. While the integrated graphics is still used a bit, utilization is a lot lower, so those other systems tend to take a loss here. Resolve performance, on the other hand, puts a lot of emphasis on GPU horsepower and more lightly threaded performance when processing this render. And that's why the NUC 11 gets such good results, and even the GE76 Raider is up there too. But that laptop is actually rocking an RTX 3080 instead of the RTX 3080 Ti's that were installed in these other systems. And now in gaming, so starting at 1080p so we can get a little bit of that GPU bottleneck out of the way, and what you'll see here is the same story repeated over and over again. The NUC 11 just posts some crazy good numbers in games that use a single core or are very lightly threaded, like CSGO and Valorant. Even when the GPU steps in to limit things a bit, it's still right up there kicking with the 11900K most of the time, and generally beating the NUC 9 by a wide margin too. And for those of you saying, well, just buy a gaming laptop, I'd agree with you in most cases, especially if the GPU prices stay the way they are right now, but remember, that GE76 is a $3400 US laptop that gets pounded at 1080p like it owes these other systems money. Moving on to a little bit higher resolution, and things start tightening up between the NUX and the desktop system as the GPU becomes a little bit more of a bottleneck in most situations. The laptop falls a little bit further behind in some areas too, but that's to be expected considering it's using a much, much slower GPU. But I want to bring this back to the NUX 11 again, because it can compete on a level footing against a high-end desktop in gaming. Sure, there's a little bit of drawback in the 1% lows, but for the most part, it's small enough to be imperceptible. And to me, that's pretty amazing and definitely not where the last generation of NUC was. Well, guys, I guess it's time to sum all this up. And I want to start by saying that it's ultra easy to rant about Beast Canyon. You can talk all day about how they've increased the size, about how it has lost the 
the specialness of the NUC designs that have come before. And it was all done in order to cater to current needs. They wanted a gaming computer. Intel wanted to make sure that they had the capability to host some of the highest end graphics cards in the market in a compact form factor. And yes, that has brought the Beast Canyon NUC at least to a size point where it is actually competing against some of the smaller ITX cases in the market. And for NUC enthusiasts, that's going to be an issue. It's now a larger footprint. Instead of building upwards, they built outwards. And with desk space at a premium, that's an issue. And it's one of the major criticisms I have about this. But on the flip side of that coin, the NUC 11 Extreme Compute element inside, coupled with the cooling, coupled with ease of use, accessibility, everything else, makes this a really interesting piece of engineering. It has all of the hallmarks of a high-end desktop system in an efficient and quiet form factor. And then there's performance too, because that is probably the most important factor of the whole NUC 11 experience. And it's impressive, especially when it comes to single-threaded performance in games. So you have CSGO and Valorant as two excellent examples. And I guess that pretty much wraps everything up. I'm excited to see where Intel goes with this ecosystem, and I'm probably even more excited to see what their board partners do with playing with the form factor. So I'm Mike with Hardware Canucks. I'll see you in the next one. And Snows is behind the camera. Boo! Boo! This goes Canyon. Oh, ha ha. We're talking about Beast Canyon. We're you know? talking about Beast Canyon. Yeah, but, but I like but I like this form factor better. Yeah, I know. You know. Me too. Okay. All right, guys. We'll see you in the next one. Take care.